Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today we are reviewing Machina Arcana, specifically the second edition, although there is a technically third edition, although it's minor, minor changes on Kickstarter as we speak. I'll have a link down below. I'll go into a bit of a run-through, a bit of a how this game plays out, a few rounds, and then from there I'll go into my review and my final thoughts. So as usual, I'm going to be doing a bit of a run-through, more of a just quickly going through a few turns while I explain what I'm doing, how the game sequencing works. And to start with, this is going to be a very typical cooperative dungeon crawler style, meaning you're going to take actions, each player is going to take their actions using their stamina, they each have six stamina in this case. Then from there, what you're going to do is you're going to trigger the bad guys spawning, basically the monsters will spawn, from there you will have a horror phase, and then monsters will take their actions. And we'll go through each of those in sequence, you rinse and repeat while you try to win the game. And the goal in this game is ultimately survival. You're going through these chapters here, I'm, I'm up to chapter 3 right now, but you're going through all the chapters trying to progress from one chapter to the next until you eventually hit the last chapter and win the game. It's it's more about surviving than anything else really in this game. And so to start off with, we're going to have Hank taking his turn. Hank has six stamina. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to open this chest over here, drawing two items. Since he's going to, whenever you open a chest, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cap off that chest so it's no longer able to be used. I'm going to draw two items and I'm going to look at those two items. And we have over here, let's see, focus, we have a pneumatic hammer, which you can use three stamina. It's a melee attack, and it attacks with three black dice, or it has a secondary attack. Or we could do the glimpse catcher, which is two stamina, a three range, attack with one dice, but when you hit, explorers can target ethereal units this round, which can be super helpful. Hank's more of a general just force person, so we're going to keep the pneumatic hammer, and we're going to choose to put the other weapon on top of the deck because we still want that other weapon. We could have gotten rid of it, but we're going to put it on top of the deck. Now, in general, each class in this game can equip one type of item for free, meaning instead of spending extra actions to, to equip that, they can just go ahead and automatically equip it when they find it. And Hank, as a bruiser, can equip weapons for free. So we now have that over here, and we're going to lower our stamina by three because that's what it takes to open a chest. Additionally, we will gain one essence, which is very helpful. Essence is one of those things that's going to be required to progress from chapter to chapter. From there we have from there we have three actions left. We're going to go one, two, and well maybe we'll pause there. You know, we'll go one further over here three and set ourselves up for next round. Then Kim is going to take her turn. She wants to get away from these monsters over here because we specifically want these monsters to head towards Hank. And you'll see why, but we definitely want that to happen. So Kim is going to move one. She's going to spend two stamina, so one to move, two stamina to explore a new map tile, which we'll draw out over here. We will orient it with this little pip over there. We'll have to move these monsters. Probably should have better thought through this play area. Or maybe we'll just move these tiles up a bit. I don't know, we'll see if we can get the space in. And then from there, we now have a new space on the board. She spent two stamina to do so. And then she's going to end that off by walking. Uh, maybe we'll walk one. We want to kind of open a chest, but we'll set ourselves up for next round. We'll set ourselves up over here. We'll go one, two, three. Fairly boring turn, but now she's next to two chests. She's next to an event space. She's well set up for next round. Has an exploding barrel here that she's just out of range of. So lots of options on the table. That's basically our turn. Our stamina goes down to zero. We used up all our stamina. And now it's the monster's turn. Now in the monster's turn, for each adventurer in the game, this is the monster's spawn phase, the monster's spawn phase, for each adventurer in the game, you're going to roll this 10-sided die and compare it to the current horror and, well, the monster threat and the horror level. So we're going to roll it for Hank first, and we rolled a 4. That is lower than the current threat of 7, so we're going to lower this meaning the next time we try to spawn monsters, it's that much more likely we'll spawn something. We'll do the same for Kim over here, and Kim rolled a 2. Again, no monsters, nice and easy, things are going well. Then we're going to roll for the horror phase. This one we're measuring against a threat of 4, and we rolled a 5. So we will indeed trigger a horror phase, and we're going to look at this card. Now I'll note, had this, had this been a little bit lower down, let's say had it had been a 3, at this point what we would have done is whenever we do trigger it, we also reset the threshold to whatever the chapter threshold is over here. But we're going to go ahead and read this. Now, there's a lot of flavor text. You know what? Let's go ahead and read the flavor text. A gust of strange fumes filled the place like a giant wave. And after a full, only a few moments, we were left paralyzed, frozen in position as the miasma enveloped us. Our open eyes watered with our futile efforts to remain mobile, and it was only sheer desperation that allowed us to take any actions at all. Explorers can't move this round. Well, that's harsh. Wow, that's a paralyzing fog. This is going to stay in effect until the next horror event, and explorers can't move, which is pretty bad. That is not great at all. 
Fortunately, we are well set up for next round. Kim is well set up next round to open chests. We have no monsters on the board. All in all, this can be a devastating card. Right now, it happens to not be the worst. So we've now triggered the Horror Vase, and now we're going to activate the monsters one at a time. So the Moon Beast is going to go first. Moon Beast has five stamina. Let's show you some stats on the cards over here. The Moon Beast, if we focus, has four armor, three sanity, which is basically a will, or three will, which is good for uh, arcane attacks, one health, so it only takes one wound to kill it, and five stamina. And then in general, they're going to try to trigger their actions first, but in this case, he can't trigger any of his actions, or she, who knows. And they're going to try to move towards us and then do their, their stuff. So to begin with, the Moon Beast is going to move five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, it would have loved to have triggered any of its actions, but it couldn't because it never had enough stamina to do so, so it just continues to move closer to us. Then the Biaki, who moves four, is going to again try to do the same thing. It looks like Kim might be a drop closer. Let's try to figure this out. We're going to go one, two. Um, it look, no, it looks like hangs closer. Uh, three, and it maybe it stops there. Now, full transparency, I'm not 100% sure some of the ways that these guys will choose their actions if it's blocked. So that's an actually a case that hasn't happened to me yet. So it could be a would pivot, I don't know, but we'll leave it there for right now. Well, partially because it's going to be fun. And then from there, we go ahead and take our turns. Now, Hank can't move, which is unfortunate, but what Hank can do is he can activate this trap space over here. So Hank is going to go ahead and take his turn. He's going to activate the trap space, putting a token down on it to show that it's been activated. And then he's going to roll three dice against every monster that is on a grill space on this board, which is both, both of them, basically. Biaki and the Moon Beast are both on a space. We're going to roll three dice, a three die attack, that was actually one of the worst attacks I have ever seen. That basically is three. I have a, a damaged die here. This is not a one. This is nothing. I rolled nothing. Absolutely nothing, which honestly has never happened to me in this game. Every time I have ever attacked with a trap, it has basically killed everyone. Uh, that was literally a, what is that? A one in 216 chance that you get three nothings, which is pretty bad. Don't get me wrong. I could have rolled something and still not done damage. Either way, those both survive, which is not good for me at all because I can't move, which means they're going to both attack me at the end of the round. For the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spend three stamina because I can't move, unfortunately, which is really unfortunate. I'm going to spend three stamina, activate this event space over here, gaining an essence. So that's both all of my six of my stamina is utilized because both those take three stamina each. And I will read this event card. I will skip the flavor text this time. But basically, spend three at three. Oh wow, this is a rotating panel. You can spend three stamina to rotate a map tile clockwise. That is pretty cool. Honestly, I'm getting pretty cool events here that I haven't really gotten before. Uh, from there, Kim's going to take her turn. She's going to spend three stamina, and she is going to uh, open a chest first, I think, because I like that event. I don't want to mess with that event. We're going to open a chest. She's a gunman, so she can equip apparel first. So she's going to spend three stamina, activating this chest, upgrading an essence. And then she's going to her stamina at six. We're going to go lower to three. We're going to draw two apparel. And we have over here the trench coat. When one hand is unequipped, increase your attack rolls by one. Plus it adds two armor. Plus it's a central piece of equipment that other items can be equipped to. And then we have the scryer. Look at the top two cards of any item deck and deck and reorder them. I'm going to go ahead and take the trench coat. And I'm going to get rid of the scryer, putting that away. So we're going to equip the trench coat automatically. She now has plus two armor, which is excellent because... Well, she's a little more uh, fit. We still can't move, so we're again going to open a treasure chest. And this time, I think we're going to go ahead and take consumables because I'm hoping, I'm really just hoping for a death whistle, which is a very particular hope. But you'll see what happens if we get it. Nope, no death whistle. So we have a full genus flask. Flask target unit is ethereal this round. Explorers can target ethereal units this round. That's helpful. And para para praxis sack. Skip target monsters turn this round. Ooh. The problem is we don't have any more stamina, or that would have been a whole lot better. So we're going to go ahead and take this one, though, because it can be very useful. Uh, we would have to discard it. That's that symbol over there. But it's still pretty useful, so we're going to go ahead and take that. And the other one we'll also discard. So we now have this over here. Uh, this is a consumable, which means it does not need to be equipped. We can just use it at any point. And that is basically our turns, which was a pretty devastating turn considering the fact that we can't move, which is unfortunate. This is not going at all the way I planned. I plan to activate a trap exploding everything for you, but we have to adjust and adapt. And from there, we'll go to the phase, the, the spawn phase. So we'll spawn. Hank rolls a zero. Now, in the basic game, in the basic version of the game, zero means ten, as opposed to in the slightly easier version, zero means zero. We are playing the normal version, so we're going to go ahead and reset the spawn to seven, and we will indeed spawn a monster. Drawing a card, adding it to the row. It's the Yadatham. 
So we're going to go ahead and find this yada thumb over here. Perfect, right over there. That was well picked. We're going to go ahead and we're going to spawn it on the closest spawn zone in range. This is a spawn zone, but our closest spawn zone to Hank is up here. Then Kim's going to roll for herself, and she rolled a 4, so we're going to lower this track by 1. Then we roll for the horror phase. We rolled a 9, so we're going to activate another horror phase, which is good because we can move again. And this one is repeat the spawn phase, which is absolutely terrible. This is, this is punishing. This is absolutely punishing. So we're going to repeat the spawn phase. We rolled a 6. We're going to spawn another monster. And then I'm not actually going to activate all these monsters. I'll explain that shortly. We're going to grab the rat beast, which is over here, the rat thing. And we're going to put that in play again next to next to the spawn face when it's occupied. And then we're going to roll it again for Kim. And she rolls a 3. Kimmy seems to be lucky. I'd rather Kim roll them, but that's unfortunate. That was a pretty brutal round. And now we're going to activate the actual monsters themselves, which the Moon Beast is going to activate first. I think I'll just activate the Moon Beast and Biaki, and we'll call that a day and move into the review phase. Moon Beast is going to go ahead and walk one. So it's actually it's going to pull me first. The first thing it can do is it can spend two of its uh, stamina to pull me towards it. So it's going to go ahead and do so. Uh, the good news is it's blocking my situation, so I can't actually get hit by both of them, which is nice. Then it's going to spend three stamina to attack me with two black and two white dice. I'm sure it will have a better roll than I did. Sure enough, that is six pips altogether. The dice range, black dice are more powerful, but all of them range between zero and three effectively. The white dice are between zero and two. Black dice are slightly stronger. That's a roll of six compared to our armor of three. We don't have any equipment that buffs our armor like Kim does, so we are going to go ahead and take a wound, which may not seem like a big deal, all that energy for one wound, but there's not a lot of opportunities in this game to recoup your health. So that can be a really it's really problematic. You do not want to get stuck with taking wounds in this game. Uh, then the Biaki is going to move. The Biaki can't actually attack me. And as I mentioned before, one of the situations I actually don't know what to do with is I don't know if it stays here or starts moving towards Kim. So I have to look up that sequencing. Uh, but that's basically it. Each of the monsters would activate in turn, continuing the sequence. We'd rinse and repeat until we actually finish the game. But that's basically it. It's a survival game. You want to get equipment, slowly level up, try to navigate the board, survive. I had this all planned out perfectly until I A, rolled a trap thing that did not destroy anything, which is absolutely bizarre for me, and then two, we couldn't move at all. So basically, everything conspired against us to have a great round for you guys to watch. Until next time, I can't say until next time, we haven't done the review phase. Let's do the review phase, and then we'll go into there. And so that was Machina Arcana. As you can see, it's pretty simple to pick up. All you really need to know is the general turn structure, the concept of your stamina, the specific actions you can take on your turn, and that is all you really need to get people going, which really is the first thing I like about this game. The structure I generally have for these is what I liked, what I didn't like, what I can see others not liking, and then of course my final thoughts. And so like I said already, my first thing that I like about this game is it's very simple to teach. You can get people up and running in a few minutes by just teaching them some basic concepts, and then all those edge cases, and there are edge cases, keep in mind, despite being simple to teach, it's still 30 pages of rules because all the things you need to know, all the sequencing, how different creatures act in different ways, which you already saw, I don't even know all those myself, because I don't even need to to actually get the game going. Secondly from there, the second thing I liked is that every map tile is dragged drastically different. This is a game where as you go through different map tiles, each one of these has a very, very different feel to the way it plays out. And many of these are double-sided as well. Most of them are double-sided. But because of the, the greats and the layouts of the treasures and the different aspects to them, they all end up feeling very, very different. Contrasted with, let's say, a game like Zombicide, uh, where every map tile is functionally different, but ultimately feels very samey. In Machina Arcana, you will pull out map tiles, especially once you get to know the game. Once you play it a, a lot more, you will pull out a map tile and you'll be like, ooh, that one, that's great. I'm happy we have that one. There's there's a real feel and a flavor to the way these integrate and the different strategies and way to maneuver the board depending on what map tile you're drawing. I like the fact that the difficulty modifiers in this game are present. And now, basically, the game is critiqued to a certain degree as being pretty hard. I don't actually think it is that hard. I'll get to that. But if you do believe it's pretty hard, there are small tweaks you can make that will really make a difference. Even something as simple as you, as I saw already, as you saw in the run through, we're counting the zero as a 10 or the 10 as a zero. Just that one shift, a one tenth time that actually happens, that ends up being a significant enough difference to make the game just enough easier that if you were having a hard time with it, well, now you can actually make your way through and hopefully survive. 
The game is also not a table hog, and that's specifically, usually the concept of a table hog is a con, and the lack of being a table hog is not really a pro, but specifically here, the reason I have that as something I like is in this genre of game, in this genre of gaming in which you basically are playing a dungeon crawler to an extent, they tend to be very much table hogs. I love, I like them a lot, don't get me wrong, with Zombicide, Black Plague, Cthulhu Death May Die, Gloomhaven, any of the games in this genre, they tend to be pretty table intense, and Machina Arcana is not like that at all. The game only takes up a 2x2 two two of the map tiles, and because of the scrolling system they have, as you move off one map tile, you'll get rid of the others, so you only are ever playing on a 2x2 two two grid. The actual items and everything else, they take up space, but not a ton of space, and for the game that it's delivering, it's surprisingly accessible in terms of the table space. Additionally, this game plays well solo, and it plays well at two players. It does not play as well at three and four, and we'll get to that in the what I didn't like or what others don't like, but it plays very well solo, and it plays very well two players. Two player feels a little more like a team experience, and it is more fun in that sense as you work together. Solo is a little faster. If, you, if one of the problems you have with this game is how fast it plays, then it is faster when you play it solo because you can kind of go through all these things in your head. There's a lot of repetitive stuff going on in this game, which we'll get to as well, but those repetitive things when you're talking with other players and you're when you're walking it through each time while enjoyable and while it adds to the camaraderie it is a little slower when you play it solo it is significantly faster as you just rattle through those things in your head the art is amazing the art in this game is off the charts i love this box i love the map tiles individual card art or whatnot let's see if we can any of these things that you have over here, the art in this game is absolutely gorgeous. It, it, it really draws you in, it is consistent, it is well done. I'm a huge fan of the art in Machina Arcana. The, speaking of which, the world building. The world building from the story they have, and the story can be skipped, which is another pro. Each of these cards, like you saw already, each of these cards will have story on it, but then ultimately you can ignore most of the story and just focus on the text. And I like the fact that they both give you the story, and allow you to completely ignore it. Speaking for myself, as someone who doesn't really like story in most games, in this game I do. In this game I like reading each of the chapters as I go through it. I feel like there's more of a nuance to what's happening, even though semantically it really doesn't matter at all, but I do appreciate it for what it's doing. And then that art, the, the, the theme, the structure, the steampunk nature combined with the Cthulhu mythos, it really does a fantastic job at the world building that is going on here, at the story, the art, the presentation, and I'm a huge fan of the Mark and Arcana world. And if you follow the, the Kickstarter, the creator, they really take this very much to heart. Everything is referred to as, she will draw you in. They, they have videos that really, I mean, it's off the top, it's off the charts, the way that they embrace this world themselves and the way they they bring it into the, the the actual board game as you play it i love the tenseness and this is more gameplay aspect but i love the tenseness of every move mattering in this game in this game as you do different things everything matters this is not a game where you're like well i guess i'll search no you will sit there and you will decide can you risk the possibility of opening a chest will it allow those monsters to get closer to you because everything in this game comes down to survival everything comes down to understanding that you have six stamina and you can you can attack someone and take up half your stamina you can open a a, a treasure chest and take up half your stamina or you can run and all those things are important and incredibly instrumental incredibly important to what's going to happen as you play this game. You need to understand that it's not a simple decision to do one thing or the other. Your literal survival depends upon it. And I'll get more into that in my final thoughts, but Machina Arcana is a game that isn't hard, it is just exacting. It is very exacting in what it allows you to do and the decisions you'll have to make when you can pause to equip an item versus when you have to keep moving because that is how you'll currently survive. I love the fact that it's about knowing how to take advantage of the board and not about just, you know, shooting things. See, the problem is many of these creatures, while they may not actually be that hard to inflict a wound to them, the first problem you have is what if you roll poorly? The second problem is what if they have two lives? If they have two lives, you have to get them out on your turn or they're going to hit back and your life, your own life is precious. You do not have many opportunities to recoup your life and so you have to understand every time you make a move. So very often, like you saw in the playthrough, although it didn't work out in my favor, you have to know how to position yourself, how to, how to position yourself on the board, how to draw creatures closer to you, how to activate a trap, an exploding barrel, how to use one of your abilities on your equipment to push someone off an edge. There are so many different ways you can take advantage of the environment and keep running the whole time. And that really does give you a feeling of survival in this game. It really is about running, hiding, knowing when to fight, knowing when to do something. There's a lot of tactical maneuvering going on there. And the last thing I'll say is uh, what I loved about this game, what I liked about this game, is something that if you follow my, my, my content in general, you already know. 
I love power-ups, I love abilities, I love equipment, I love all those things. I love it when a character becomes more powerful as they play the game. And that will 100% happen in Machina Arcana. It doesn't happen as much with the player abilities. The players do come into play with an initial ability. Some are more impactful than others. There are some that are really cool, some that are just okay. But the actual equipment in this game, every time you draw the equipment, it's fun. It's, what am I going to draw next? Will I draw a grenade that I can toss into a bunch of monsters, saving me from when I, well, I really need it? Or will I perhaps suddenly be able to move through walls? Or maybe I draw a piece of equipment that lets me activate all the locations on the board from one additional spot away. You will become increasingly more adept at this game, not because your character levels up, but because the equipment they get is cool, it's functional, it levels up your stats, and it gives you things that you can do that you couldn't otherwise have done. I absolutely love the equipment in Machina Arcana, and they do a great job making it all, all, all of it's useful. But some of it is use more useful and some of it is more cool than others. And there are different tiers to the equipment deck that will come into play as you go through the story. So you'll start off with level 1 equipment, but then later in the game you'll add the level 2 and the level 3 equipment. And that really provides a feeling of escalation as you hope, well now that I have the level 3 equipment, maybe I'll get that Gatling gun and can start mowing things down. There are a lot of things you can do in the equipment, and they are basically all fun. And with that, let's get into what I didn't like about the game. And the first one is, well, again, knowing me and the stuff I like, these are standees, not minis. Now, I know why they're that way, because they've, they've addressed this in the past, that the smallness of the map squares make it very hard to functionally utilize minis, and maybe the scale will be out of proportion, but, I mean, the standee scale is out of proportion too. I want minis. I, I mean, this is such an amazing universe. I want minis. I mean, someone should come out. Maybe, uh, what's it called? Blacklist Games has a horror line coming out. Maybe you could sit there and make some minis for Machina Arcana. You'd have somewhere in the range of 5,000 people potentially interested in it. I don't know if it's 5,000, but whatever it is, you'd have a lot of people interested in those minis because this is a game that does an amazing job building a world, but then they just rely on standees, and they're fine, don't get me wrong. I still love this game, spoilers, but nonetheless, I am sad that this game does, for everything it does well, it doesn't have miniatures, and I do like minis in my games. I do like minis when I'm running around a board trying to survive or trying to mow you down or any of those stuff. The second thing I don't like is that it is long for what it is, and I touched upon that already. But this is a game that, as much as I love the game, it can draw out. Now, for sure with three and four players. Three and four players, I'd be hesitant to ever play it again with... I, I don't think I'd ever play it with four. I'd be hesitant to play it with three. And two versus one is a tough call, because two does add that camaraderie, but one is faster. I can get a one-player game of this gone in like 90 minutes. With two, it's like two hours or something like that. It adds an extra half an hour, but it adds another person. It's, it's a tough sell. And then with three and four, you're just adding more players without adding to the experience as much. And so it is long for what it is. I kind of wish they had a condensed version that didn't feel like it was compromising on it. And that might be something they they're, they're doing in the new Kickstarter. I don't actually know. But I do know the, the, the guidebook will give you an introductory scenario where you can play like three or chapters or five chapters instead of all ten. But it doesn't feel doesn't doesn't feel like you're getting the full experience. I don't I don't know. I just wish it was a little bit shorter for what it is, especially because of the repetitive nature of the gameplay, which doesn't bother me, but we'll get to that. And the last thing I'll say, in terms of what I didn't like about the game, is as good as the game is, the text in the game very heavily prioritizes functionality over readability. Now what I mean by that is very often you will read a card, you will read a monster, and you'll have to be like does this do that or does this do this? They very often leave out keywords that are kind of assumed in terms of the way things are targeted, in terms of the way different options have different abilities. They, you have to kind of read them and hope you understand them. They very often, not functionality, they very often prioritize brevity over functionality, over clarity. And that, that it's good in the long run as you know stuff because you can quickly read a card and understand exactly what it does because you've been there, you've done that. But that first time round, you'll probably find yourself Googling a few pieces of equipment. You'll probably find yourself Googling what happens in some of these final chapters because it is not always clear. They very heavily prioritize brevity over clarity to the detriment of the game, in my opinion. And the last category is what I can see others not liking. And for that, again, to be clear in this category, these are things that didn't bother me. And I'll explain for each one why not. But I can see that being a problem for you. I can see it being a reason why Machina Arcana may not be a game for you. And the first is that you're running and not fighting. And you are running and not fighting. You will fight, don't get me wrong. But this is a game about positioning and tactical maneuvering far more than it is about attacking a monster and rolling a die. You never actually roll this die for monsters. 
And and for me, I didn't like that mechanic in Deep Madness. In Deep Madness, a totally different game, I didn't like it as much. I kind of wanted to fight. This one, I don't know why it's that different. For whatever reason, I enjoy the tactical positioning far more in this game. I enjoy the aspect, and maybe it's because ultimately I do kill the monsters. I sit there and just position myself, and maybe I move off the map board and they all wipe off. Maybe I set up a trap and they all go up in flames. There are ways to eventually have those fights and eventually get your way, but it is very much about the tactical positioning as opposed to the just, you know, roll or die attack a monster. Secondly, the game can range in how punishing it is. You get a few too lucky dice rolls in this game, maybe the horror track doesn't accelerate, the monster level doesn't accelerate, and you might find yourself having an easier time than, than you would like. Although you get a too, too many punishing rolls, and you might find yourself having a much harder time as you face you know, six or seven monsters when you should have been facing three. So the luck in this game is there. It's not huge, it's not hugely swingy, but certainly over different games you can have a variable experience in terms of how punishing the game is, and that could be... It, I mean, I, I wish it were a little bit more consistent in terms of that spread, and it, it definitely can vary. The third thing is that more than two players, and I touched upon this already, but more than two players already hurts more than it helps. Meaning, for me, this is the thing I didn't like is that the game is, well, long. But the thing that I can see others not liking is that it locks out three and four players. For me, that's not a problem. I have plenty of other games that are three and four players. But very much, you're going to want to really think long and hard about adding a third and fourth player to this game because it does make it much longer than it should be, and that, that can be a con. Next up is that the gameplay is very much rinse and repeat. The game is very much you're going to be doing the same things, moving to a tile, opening a chest, moving around, defeating some monsters, moving to a new tile, opening some chests, moving around, defeating some monsters. It goes through the same cycle again and again and again. Now the reason I don't mind that is because it's not as grindy as I just made it sound. It certainly is repetitive, but it's not as grindy. Each board is its own puzzle. The situation of the monsters does change the nature of the board state and what you're going to do. The fact that you're drawing equipment frequently means you're con going to be constantly adjusting those choices because suddenly you have extra abilities that change the whole dynamic. The fact that the monsters will be leveling up will change the monsters you're encountering. There are enough things that are different that it frequently becomes a new puzzle with each tile. But the actions you're taking are going to be repetitive and that might be something that you know, two hours of going through the same cycle of motion again and again might not be for you. Like I said, for me, it's just a different puzzle every time. It's two hours of unique puzzles. And then lastly, the health management in this game is, well, it's punishing. This is a game where you can't afford to lose health, at least not often. You can lose a health here, you can lose a health there, but if you don't have a character ability that lets you regain health, then you're victim to a handful of spots on the board where you can roll a die and hope to gain something. Hope. Maybe you'll get one health back after you just spent the last two turns being hit with three health from different monsters. This is a game where you very much have to worry about your health, or you will eventually find yourself slowly pinged to death. And that's really everything. That's what I liked, what I didn't like, what I can see others not liking. Which brings me to my final thoughts. What do I think about Machina Arcana? Well, if it isn't clear already, I adore this game. I think it's amazing. I think that, I don't know what it is about it 100%, but the fact that I can get up and going in five minutes, I can set this up, I can teach it, I can get moving in a, a few minutes. I, if I want to play it solo, I can just break it out and jump right in. The board is frequently presenting me with a puzzle, and it's a puzzle that I enjoy. I love the process of going through each new board and trying to figure out, well, I have to light the chapter to progress, but what am I going to do to survive? Where am I going to compromise? In which actions I give up? Where will I possibly make my way to a workbench so I can both get new items and equip everything simultaneously, but in the meantime, I'm running around with no armor and no equipment because I can't take a moment to breathe. I enjoy the world that Machina Arcana is building. I enjoy the, the theme. I enjoy the, the simplicity of the main core mechanisms. I am not as much of a huge fan of the edge cases I frequently have to look up to remind myself, which is both a pro and a con because it, it's a pro that you frequently don't encounter those or need to deal with those, but then here and there you do. But I like the rule that Machina Arcana is building. I was pulled in from when I first read the rule book. Seriously, I mean, I mean, legitimately, they have a playbook, a, a guide that you should read, which goes through a few turns. And I was already envisioning playing it before I even knew the full rules of the game. And the theme and art, like I said already, it's Machina Arcana is a game that I truly enjoy. The closest thing I can compare it to is probably Too Many Bones. But Too Many Bones is a much greater in investment in terms of understanding the characters you're playing in order to play it well. And Machina Arcana doesn't which is both a pro and a con. It doesn't have that complexity in the puzzle of developing your RPG character throughout the game, but it does have the simplicity of the rest of the gameplay with not necessarily the best rulebook. Same as Too Many Bones. A lot of rules, a lot of things to know, but the actual gameplay at the end of the day is pretty simple to, to go through. 
I really can heartily recommend Machina Arcana. Like I said, the biggest things are going to be the things I didn't like and what I can see others not liking, and those things might just be a reason for you in terms of why this might not be a game for you to enjoy. But I do recommend checking it out. It has a passionate audience. It has a passionate audience of people who have enjoyed this game, and I can see why. And I am joining their ranks. Until next time, I'm Alex Rackley from Board Game Co. I hope you found this review helpful. If you have any questions about it, please let me know in the comments down below. And like I said, check out the link to the Kickstarter. Until next time, have a good one.